Nur al-Din ibn Zangi is one of the greatest Muslim rulers of his generation. In fact, the historian Ibn al-Athir places him just after the rightly guided caliphs and Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. But who was he and why was he so admired? In this video, we will analyze the reign of Nur al-Din and what made him so successful. Born around 1118 common era within the realms of the Zangi territory, Mahmud ibn Zangi received the very best military training and religious education that the state could offer, making him the perfect candidate to replace his father. However, when that opportunity arrived, he had been faced with many problems, namely a shrinking state, the Second Crusade, and a rebellion in Edessa. All of that and a poor image from amongst the rest of the Muslims. However, not only did Nuruddin revive the Zengid's fortunes, but he also exceeded his father by a significant margin, becoming the first to unite Aleppo and Damascus since before the Crusades, and even taking Fatimid Cairo. Of this significant aspect that allowed him to turn things around was his style of leadership. Nur al-Din believed that the Zengids needed to win the hearts of the common man, and therefore approached things very differently than his father. Nur al-Din was a transformational leader, essentially someone who influences his followers by inspiring and communicating. And this was demonstrated throughout his reign. For example, he considered the needs of individuals. This was exemplified by the opening of Dar al-Adl, in which he attended as judge so that he could listen to the common man's grievances. Furthermore, he facilitated the move which allowed Osama ibn Munqid to escort his family from the back then Fatimid Cairo into Zengid Damascus. Another of his valuable characteristics was his ability to inspire and motivate. Believe it or not, it was Nur al-Din who initiated the movement to take back Jerusalem, asking scholars to focus on the virtues of the holy city so that it would become the number one priority. In preparation, he had even built a wooden pulpit for Al-Aqsa Mosque for when it was retaken. Additionally, he called upon Muslims to unite, stating, There is no need for Muslims to be slain by the hands of one another. Furthermore, he was perceived as a role model and a man of justice, earning the title the Just King, and one could easily see why. For example, he refused to accept money for the state when it was taken unlawfully, demanding, I am not able to assume its responsibility when the Almighty asks me about it on the Day of Judgment. Also, he refused to take any of the state's treasury for himself, even when his wife inquired for more personal wealth, stating, By God, I am not ready to go to the hellfire in order to meet her demands. I am the caretaker of this money, and I will never betray them. And I have three shops in hymns, and I will bestow them to her instead. Another example was when he attended court to settle a dispute that was charged against him. Reason being was when he had arrived, he informed the judge to treat him just like anybody else. Nur al-Din was also a very intelligent man who understood the importance of leadership, stating, I fear for the subjects and all the Muslims, lest there should come after me ignorant, evil-doing and oppressive governors. Like other transformational leaders, Nur al-Din enhanced what has been referred to as intellectual stimulation. For example, Nur al-Din was known to consult his administration when making key decisions. He was also not afraid to be confronted, as demonstrated by the numerous disagreements he had with his greatest general Shirko, or even when he was challenged by a trusted imam for playing polo, acknowledging the need for purposeful leisure and rest. Another reason for Nur al-Din's success had been his piety. It may be hard to comprehend, but in this era of religious and ideological conflict, Sunni Islam had lacked leaders who represented them. But here was Nur al-Din, a powerful man with scholarly knowledge, pushing for the revival of Sunni Islam. For Nur al-Din, the Ummah had strayed away from the teaching of Islam, and therefore, it needed to return to its authentic understanding for it to be victorious. Although his father had been a powerful man, it was under Nur al-Din when the re-education of the masses really began. During his reign, he opened up new mosques and Islamic centers, including 21 new madrasas, such as the Dar al-Hadith al-Nuriyah. 
He had almost a got rid of practices that were contrary to orthodox Islam, which included the slandering of any of the Sahaba and the removal of the phrase, come to the best of deeds during the Adhan. In fact, Nuruddin had been a champion of Sharia law and for the preservation of Islam. He had once said, we keep the road safe from thieves and highwaymen, while they are less harmful. So will we not preserve religion and secure it? It is the most worthy of keeping safe. He had also said, Allah, glory to be him, created people and knows what is best for them. He enacted a law which is for their benefit. If there was more benefit in something other than Islamic law, Allah would have prescribed it. So we are in no need for any other law. As for his personal life, Nuruddin lived the life of a Zahid. He hated it when people credited him with something that he did not do and showed humility. At one point saying, O oh Allah, grant victory to your religion and not me. Who is that dog at Mahmud to be honored with your victory? He also showed very little interest in materialism, famously claiming that this world, it escapes from those who seek it and seeks those who escape from it. In a more practical example, he once gave away an extravagant turban to the poor, which was once gifted to him from Egypt. The turban would later be sold in Baghdad for around 600 dinars. Instead, Nuruddin would spend a lot of his time in prayer and reading. He would also donate to the sick and the needy, the calligraphers and the teachers of the Quran. Because of this, Nuruddin earned the reputation as a champion of Islam and reviver, and his piety was even recognized by the Frankish chronicler William of Tyre. Finally, Nuruddin was a fantastic general. Described as a great warrior and a good archer by Abu Shama, the son of Zengi had already acquired a lot of experience before his reign had even begun. And it showed. As mentioned earlier, the Zengi dynasty was in chaos after the murder of his father, but rather than dwell on the seemingly inevitable collapse, he rushed to Edessa to save it from falling back into the hands of the Crusaders and succeeding in the process. The chronicler Ibn al qalanisi describes the speed in which his army travelled with great awe. They marched with all speed, a night and day, and in the early hours of the morning, so that the horses dropped by the roadsides from the fatigue of the march. Nuruddin would say, We are always at war. If the soldiers of every prince were not ready in the number and arms, the Muslims would be defeated. And the example of Edessa was only one of many, which illustrated Nuruddin's strategic decisiveness. Later, he took advantage of the opportunity left behind after the failed Second Crusade and the incompetence of the leaders of Damascus by taking the city. In fact, when he did enter Damascus in 1154, the Domitians welcomed him, for they had learned of his justice and showed very little resistance. This is a remarkable achievement considering the hatred that the Domitians once had towards the Zengids. His father had laid siege to the city multiple times and failed, but under Nur ad-Din, its citizens were practically giving it away. Furthermore, during the 1160s race for the declining Fatimid Empire, he tactically outmaneuvered King al-Marek many times. Taking advantage of the king's expedition in Egypt against Shirku, Nuruddin moved into Outer Min territory and achieved what is considered his greatest victory on the battlefield, defeating the combined forces of Tripoli, Antioch, the Byzantines and the Armenians at Harim, capturing most of their leaders. This forced King al marek to withdraw from Bilbas, where he had been laying siege to Shirko. On this matter, a master Templar begrudgingly accepted, although our King al marek is great and magnificent, thanks to God, God, he cannot organize a fourfold army to defend Antioch, Tripoli, Jerusalem, and Babylon. But Nuruddin can attack all four at one and the same time if he desires. Eventually, the Zengids would end their race by taking Fatimid Cairo in 1169. As a result, the Kingdom of Jerusalem found itself surrounded, and it only seemed inevitable that Jerusalem would fall under the hands of Nuruddin. However, it was not to be. Nuruddin would die of fever in 1174 common era, and the honor would pass on to his greatest student, Salah ad-Din. Salah ad-Din is usually the first name that is mentioned when we think of great Muslim rulers of the era. However, in my opinion, the lesser-known Nuruddin was just as great. 
In the historical sense, Nuruddin will be remembered as the man who laid the foundation for Salah ad-Din, and this is something that Salah ad-Din seems to acknowledge. However, he should also be remembered for his great leadership and influence, military prowess, a piety, love for justice, and for initiating the re-education of Orthodox Islam to the masses. All of these characteristics that made him successful in the first place. Finally, if you like this video, please remember to like, share and subscribe and remember to check out some of the other videos on this channel. For those who are interested in this era, I'm going to highlight another video which you might find interesting. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.